Terence McKenna used to present uh, several talks uh, in the 1990s he titled The State of the Stone. And among other things, it included updates about the current state of the world of psychedelics. And we, we've tried to uh, pick that up and carry that on a little bit in the last couple of years. The world of recreational drugs changes so quickly these days, with new developments continually being made uh, in chemistry, botany, use, and uh, law enforcement. A, a big part of our work is to try to track some of the changes in new drugs, what's coming out, uh, what what the trends are in psychoactive use and availability. And we, when we began the idea, uh, began Arrowwood, we, we started with the idea of collecting the existing knowledge about psychedelics and other recreational drugs in order to make sure that people in high school and your university don't have to rely solely on their 16 to 22 year old peers as the elders uh, who provide the information for them about the plants and chemicals that they have access to. But we're also trying to help the progression towards a world with a more considered view of psychoactives. In the now, the increasing pace with which new psychoactive drugs appear on the market make this increasingly difficult to achieve. It, it's, it's, it's much harder to transmit information uh, and create a, a cycle where people can learn and know from the previous uh, people when the, the drugs are changing quite as much as they are. And even if we generally know what the primary health uh, oh, health issues, health and use issues are uh, for psychedelics or for stimulants or for, you know, for depressants. Uh, it's a challenge for inf information providers like Arrowhead to, uh, as well as for harm reduction groups or for emergency room doctors to uh, deal with the rapidly shifting specifics about, uh, you know, the flurry of new uh, psychoactive chemicals and, and botanicals. As, you know, as people go through life, they learn valuable lessons about the way to, ways to use and not use visionary and other psychoactive drugs. You know, they learn, people learn about the effects on their life, their outlook, the spirituality, sexuality, their identity. As well as learning about more practical issues, you know, the impact on the physical body, hangovers and recovery time, and the effects on school or work or their career. But we, we need to work to build into the broader culture, the, a recursive cycle uh, of first watching and then participating and then passing along wisdom about visionary substances. In uh, a friend of ours, when a friend of ours was going through medical school in the late 90s, the, um, his, the motto that he was uh, for, forced, the, 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 the catchphrase was um, learn one, do one, teach one. So more experienced users and elders have a broader view after having used and, and tried and you know, learned and then had a chance to see how those choices have played out over a period of years. When people are first exposed to psychedelic plants and chemicals, the, the input from veteran users is invaluable in helping create the long view, a better sense of what, today, what effect today's choices will have when they get older. And while newer uh, psychoactive users are the ones most in need of practical information about recreational drugs, they don't really have the quality of information they deserve without a dynamic exchange with more experienced users. We, we have giant bugs hitting us in the back of the head occasionally, so <laughs> apologize Excuse for <laughs> strange. In, in the 1960s and early 1970s, there was a strong sense of novelty as the widespread experimentation with newly available psych psychedelics began, uh, became popular, especially among teens and u university students, but also among middle-aged people. And those involved the first big wave of modern experimentation with psychedelics. Uh, in the early 60s, th those that were involved are now all over 65, or you know, many are in their 70s. They, they learned a lot in a short period. Uh, about how to deal with the newly available drugs and how to make most how to make the most of them, it was in most cases sink or swim, uh, acid test type events. You know, threw people in. They took they took what was available, and the people who liked the experience that they had came back and tried it again. And the people who had bad experiences left and didn't try again mostly. Uh, and most of those psychoactives that saw much use are still around and considered the sort of classics of the psychedelics. 
So we're going to uh, try something slightly different. We wanted to continue to ask some more questions of the audience, of the participants. Um, but is Martin around? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> because we can't really see as very well past the first couple of rows of people, we thought we'd have someone stand at the back and tell us. Do the, do the estimating of answers a little bit better than we could. No double hands, anybody. <laughs> cheating. No, <laughs> no cheating. No cheating. <laughs> so how many people here have tried LSD? I'd say about 95%, no, maybe 90%. Excellent. And how many people have side, tried psilocybin containing mushrooms? Uh, 96%. <laughs> <laughs> and how many people have tried mescaline or mescaline containing cactus? Good numbers, yeah, probably 65, 70, 60%, I reckon. Okay, good. So uh, according to the National Australian Surveys, the uh, 7 to 10% of Australians, 14 and older, have tried ever re reported ever using any hallucinogen. So that's slightly different numbers than this higher. audience. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see we've got 95% of the 14 right, exactly. population. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the late 1970s through the early 1990s, there were a few new psychoactives available to the public, and much and um, more experimentation in, into the nuances of existing plants and drugs. One of the most important drugs that gained popularity during that period was the, the ecstasy type uh, intactogenic, intactogenic uh, drugs. How, how many people have tried ecstasy that they thought actually contained MDMA, MDA, MDE, that kind of stuff? Uh, oh, well, yeah, probably less than I'd expect, 70% maybe. Okay. Uh, according to the surveys, in the mid-1990s, that was 3% of the population over in, 14 in, in Australia. Australia. And 6 to 10% uh, in the last decade, have have. In the, part of the reason that we're we're uh, being a little we're, we're giving ranges is that these surveys aren't all that good. <laughs> in the mid 1990s, the explosion in electronic communication allowed for the beginning of publicly archiving specific details and knowledge about psychedelics and recreational drugs, uh, what we call the shulganamines, um, which are the uh, chemicals that were popularized either first synthesized and or popularized by Sasha Shulgin. Uh, like 2CB, increased in popularity, and ecstasy and psychedelic rave culture also became mainstream for youth. You know, in the 90s, in the late 90s through 2000s, it was the beginning of the online research chemical availability. You know, the improved technology for drug design and drug produ production have led us back to a great breadth of new drugs being explored and sold. In the now, what's novel is not any individual new discovery or product, What's novel is that there's a constant stream of new materials, new packaging, new ways of gray marketing designed so that consumers can access new recreational drugs for as long as possible before law enforcement catches up and makes them illegal. In the 1960s, new drugs became available, but in the now, a vendor producer can, in a 12-month period, choose a new chemical, have both lab and human testing done on it, mass produce it, market it, get it advertised through the subculture, and have it sold and shipped to your door anywhere in the world. In the last five years, we've gone through multiple trends of newly available types and classes of recreational drugs that have been developed, manufactured, marketed, become popular, and then made illegal, followed quickly by another replacement. In, in 2006, a, a new psych synthetic cannabinoid became available, or multiple synthetic cannabinoid, cannabinoids became available. Deposited on herbal blends and sold as incense, but intended for smoking. They were sold openly in slick professional packaging made out of mylar. This is the original packaging for Spice. That was the first commercial brand of the synthetic cannabinoid material. But in, in order to inv avoid law enforcement scrutiny for as long as possible, the product relied on word of mouth to push sales without actually identifying what chemicals were in it. And this is, the fo this is a photo of the original Spice. You can see seeds, mullein, bits of flowers, stem pieces, etc. And then starting in late 2007, a variety of knockoff products began being sold. And these products were wildly successful. Small European vendors reported doing thousands of dollars of sales every day. And one store in Oklahoma, which is in the middle of the United States, um, that sold K2, it was uh, one of the largest spice knockoffs uh, in the US. They said that they, told, they said that they sold nearly $10,000 per day of spice. It took 36 months until November of 2009 before the chemicals in spice were identified. Spice variants were tested by a couple of labs and found to contain several different chemicals, including JWHO18 and a homologue of CP47497. 
Some contained mul multiples of the cannabinoid receptor agonists, and others contained just a single chemical. It, annoyingly, the, the reason that we often use the term cannabinoid receptor agonist is because you can't just call them cannabinoids, because cannabinoids suggest that it's things found in cannabis or things like things found in cannabis. But um, many of these chemicals are actually things that will stimulate the endogenous, the in, in the human body, receptors, but not actually look like in, or, or be chemically similar to the chemicals in cannabis at all. So we, so the kind of standard thing is to call them cannabinoid receptor agonists, which is a bit of a mouthful. So how many people know about these types of sort of synthetic cannabinoid products? About 50, 50 plus percent. Okay. And how many people have tried one of them? About the same. <laughs> <laughs> Once the chemicals had been identified, various countries began making them, making the chemicals illegal, month by month, continuing through the present. In, in March 2011, the U.S. emergency scheduled five of the compounds, uh, and Australia banned a series of them in July, just a few months ago. But because there are many different synthetic cannabinoids, when one becomes illegal, the manufacturers simply change what chemicals they use in their products to say, stay ahead of the law. They, they advertise on their websites and packages that their products, quote, do not include banned substances. But of course, they don't identify actually what's in the products. And there are dozens of different products like this still available online, sold and shipped inside the US, Australia, and around the world. And then in, in 2008 and 2009, uh, powdered chemicals following, followed Spice's footsteps. Actual you know, pure chemicals uh, that were sold online for over 10, uh, I got confused. For the past 10 years especially phenethylamines and tryptamines, <laughs> such as AMT and the two Cs. Uh, it wasn't until 2009 that vendors widely took the path of, of you know, slick productized packaging. The new twist with Spice was that they marketed them as non-drug products. They sold them th as things like bath salt and plant food, but in the same slick kind of packaging. And these, these products also are amazingly, have been amazingly popular with bath salts, for example, being one of the top five search terms, the, the phrase bath salts. Um, that people enter into the arrowhead search engines. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the variety of these prol proliferated. Um, as with spice, the chemicals were almost never identified. The products were usually labeled not for human consumption. And the contents change over time in the same product to comply with changing legal restrictions in various countries or perhaps based on what chemicals are available to the vendor. And because it's an international market, the vendors can choose to not ship to countries that are ahead of the curve in controlling a substance until they decide to change the contents and then start shipping back into countries that the chemicals that are currently in the product are no, are no longer illegal in. How many here have read or heard about bath salts? 40, 40%, or 30 to 40%. And how many people have, have any idea of what the, the actual chemicals that they contain are or what the effects are like? Zero. <laughs> no, no, no. About five percent. Less. The chemicals contained in these products have most often, most often turned out to be variants of cathinones, similar in structure to MDMA or methamphetamine. Uh, they often have a strong stimulant effect and some euphoria. One of the early cathinones that was identified in, in these new products was 4-methylmethcathinone, also called mephedrone. And 4-methylmethcathinone became hugely popular in Britain, Ireland, and Scandinavian countries in 2009, and then I think soon after here in Australia. To help, to help uh, get an idea of how popular these things were, um, in late 2009, the National Addiction Center in London surveyed 2,300 readers of, the, of Mix Mag uh, magazine. It was a dance culture magazine, and found that 41% of those surveyed had tried 4-methylmethcathinone, and 33% had used it in the last month, making it the sixth most, most popular drug among clubbers after tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, ecstasy, and cocaine. And then even more amazing, the British Crime Survey, published just in July of this year, found that 4.4% of all 16 to 24-year-olds in the UK had tried methadrone in the last year, that tied it with cocaine for the second most used illegal drug after cannabis. And this, these are, this is a, a substance which was essentially unheard of five years before. And it was, you know, tying cocaine just after cannabis, whatever, not just after, um, after cannabis for the most popular drug in Britain among the young people. And so how many people here have tried one of the products sold as bath salts or plant foods? Wait, I know, specifically sold as mephedrone. No. Or, 
I'm good. I'm, I'm wrong. Both questions. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Ignore me. Okay. Yeah, couple. Okay, so wait. So try that one more time. So, so bath salts <laughs> or plant foods? Uh, yeah, probably five, five, ten percent. Ten percent. And how many people have tried something that was specifically sold as one of the named chemicals? So methadrone or, uh, you know, MDPV or methylone? About the same, ten percent. The, the UK banned for methylmethacathinone in April 2010, and along with changing their laws to allow them to ban things more quickly. Uh, Ireland then enacted a new type of control law in August 2010 to deal with the proliferation of new recreational research chemicals. It has some parallels with US Analog Act and I think the Australian Analog Act. Uh, it makes it de facto illegal to sell any psychoactive substance for human consumption unless that chemical has been approved by the government. So everything is illegal already unless you get it approved. And it's one of the broadest prohibition laws that we know of. In 2010 in Australia, busts and import restrictions began to be targeted at these cathinone stimulants. In 2010 and 2011, U.S. states started ba banning various cathinones, many doing mass controls of dozens at once. And then six weeks ago, uh, the U.S. Uh, emergency controlled, you know, all of basically the, the main set of them, MDPV and 4-methylmethcathinone and methylone. This is a, a Charge Plus is an example of one of these products sold as bath salts. It's been av available since at least 2009, and it currently comes in packaging that contains 200 milligrams of powder. And the inside of the package has this very cryptic harm reduction type language in it with this very thin pretense of being a not for human consumption bath salt type product. So it says, um, for best results, make sure your bath has plenty of fluid and that no machinery is operated near it. But testing con uh, conducted earlier this year by Energy Control in Spain shows that Charge Plus, Plus is an example of a product where the vendor has rotated the contents over time. Samples tested in March 2010 and then February this year, 2011, contained ca a cathinone variant for fluoromethcathinone, or 4-FMC, but a sample tested a few months later in May 2011 contained MDPV instead. It also sometimes contains lidocaine, uh, which is mixed in to make it more palatable for snorting. The Charge Plus, Charge Plus package doesn't identify what chemical it contains, how pure it is, or how many doses are included. The powder isn't comprised of a single pure chemical, so even those who know what the substance is in the package they bought don't know what the dosage should be. So a common dosage of 4-FMC, which is what was found in, in March of 2010, uh, is 100 to 200 milligrams when snorted. So with a 200 milligram package, it can contain one to two doses. But the common dose of MDPV, which was then later sold in the same packaging, is much lower at sort of 3 to 15 or maybe 20 milligrams snorted. And so a 200 milligram package of Charge Plus could, could possibly contain 20 to 40 doses of MDPV, as long as they don't dilute it down uh, to be consistent with the previous uh, product, which was about 1 to 2 doses per package. But of course, because it continues to change, it's very difficult to know the answer to which one it actually contained, but one could have in the switch between those two gotten a 10 or 20 times overdose based on the same exact amount of powder in the same exact packaging. But the, um, the package's description is to use a, quote, small sprinkle. Which is not very helpful. So samples of 16 other bath salt brands that were tested by energy control in the past year have found eight different primary active chemicals, mostly cathinone variants. So that's methylone, butylone, D2PM, which we don't actually know what that is, 3,4-DMMC, uh, 4-methyl-F-cathinone, 4-MEC, dimethyl-F-cathinone, uh, methylene dioxy amino indan MDAI, and 2-AI, 2-AI, 2-amino indan. In, in May this year, we were contacted by a person in Florida who told us about their, uh, that the pr plant food product uh, he'd been taking. He described that not long ago he had been an overweight junkie, that was his term, after becoming addicted to painkillers following a car accident six years previously. And then he, he began insufflating the pure brand of plant food, uh, a couple of milligrams a few times a day, and he not only loved it, but he had basically had a life-changing experience with it. He'd, since he'd begun using it, he'd been motivated to play his guitar more, had started running on the beach to, for exercise, he'd lost 25 pounds, he'd been taken off his high blood pressure medication, had weaned himself off of the Suboxone that he was taking to, to uh, treat his opiate addiction, he'd stopped needing sleep medication, so he was sleeping better had gone so far as to get a battery of blood tests done because he couldn't believe the positive effects and had, you know, to compare them against previous blood tests that he'd done to find out and make sure that there were positive or benefit or positive or negative health changes. His, his main complaint was that he felt like he was vibrating a lot of the time. <laughs> it's a stimulant, yes. 
so the interesting thing was that he had read that some of the plant food products contained MDPV. And, but in Florida, where he lives, the schedule, they had already scheduled MDPV and previously in that year. And, so, and the product that he was using, this pure, bland, pure brand plant food, specifically stated on it that it does not contain MDPV. In fact, even though it was marketed as a plant food and as not for human consumption, the bottle also amusingly listed 25 recreational drugs that it does not contain. It does not contain 5-MeO-DMT, 4-MMC, methylone, methadrone, 3-FMC, 4-MEC, MDAI, PFM, PFPP, D-amphetamine, ketamine, PCP, 4-methamphetamine, BZP, TFMPP, fentramine, D-methamphetamine, MDPV, 3,4-MDA, 3,4-MDMA, 3,4-MDE, butarbital, amabarbital, cecabarbital, <laughs> hexabarbital, phenobarbital. It's, it's a plant food. Yeah. So he wanted to know if we could test the powder to find out what was in it. But a, a sample tested by our ex, ecstasy data lab uh, found that the powder was, in fact, MDPV. Yeah, one of the substances specifically named as not being contained in the product. It'll, it'll, it, it seems like it'll be really interesting to get this guy's perspective in a year or two uh, about what his experience was, because he, he's you know, sold that this is basically this life-changing positive, uh, positive substance, and it's, it's been banned, and so it's unclear whether he'll be able to get it or not anymore. So in addition to the sales of chemicals marketed as non-drug products, the sale of pure chemicals as pure chemicals, packaged minimally and shipped internationally around the world, is also alive and well. A, a gram of powder in plastic pressed tightly between two pieces of paper can be sent in a normal letter envelope or in a CD case. And 10 grams can easily fit undetectably in an overnight document envelope or in the smallest shipping box. With some substances, the dosages are under 10 milligrams. So a, a small single gel cap that holds around 300 milligrams, that's 20 to 50 doses of MDPV, so in a small capsule. And, and for substances like some of the um, uh, dragonfly or um, some of the brain's going to lose it. Um, other, other, new, other new substances um, uh, are active in sort of the milligram range, and that hundreds of doses can fit in a single capsule. And the chemicals are, seem to be manufactured primarily in China, but also in Europe and in the United States. And many of the vendors have shipping points on multiple continents, so that uh, some of the products are shipped from China, some from Europe, some from South America or Pacific Island nations. And some are shipped inside the United States um, and maybe from Australia. We don't actually know about that. Um, in order to bypass and confuse customs. Um, the We're interested in whether or not there are any that are being shipped or, or manufactured in Australia, so if anybody knows, you should come up and talk to us afterward. But it's it, a global trade of chemical products that it's practically impossible to stop, with them being sold from um, the, a variety of countries, with the money being taken from a variety of countries, with banks in, in, in different, you know, some products are actually sold, sold online from one country, money is taken to a from a different country, they're shipped from a third country, um, and so it's just this very global market. Another new development in the now is the development of digital currencies, such as Bitcoin, and some of the strange outgrowths from these currencies. Uh, I'm sure some of you know about Bitcoin. Um, uh, how, how many people ha have heard of Bitcoin before? Okay, okay. 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 good. Um, you know, it's a, dig it's a digital currency that's communally created through computationally complex calculations that result in a controlled worldwide generation of new Bitcoins over time. And an integral part of Bitcoin is its distributed peer-to-peer -peer network of cryptographically signed transactions that keep a record uh, of who has received and now owns which Bitcoin. So, and Tor is, a, is a, a technology system designed to enable online anonymity and the ability to serve and browse websites in a way that makes it very difficult to monitor and track. The, the combination of these two technologies, uh, so one comment about Bitcoin. Bitcoin has, has suffered a little setback over the last few months. It had uh, gone kind of crazy for a few months when the speculation about its future and its price is now much, much lower than it used to be. But the combination of these two technologies, Bitcoin and Tor, um, which provides the anonymous, untrackable web posting and communication, um, created uh, the opportunity for projects like Silk Road. Silk Road is a Tor-only website where vendors sell explicitly illegal products in exchange for Bitcoins. <clears throat> so LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, ecstasy, you can see on this slide that uh, the, there's the currency icon which tells you in Bitcoins the price. Um, and so those numbers are from a couple of months ago, but at the time each Bitcoin was worth about $14. So 
uh, the 25, you can see 25 hits of, of acid for 13, uh, 1347 bitcoins, which is roughly uh, 190 Australian dollars. So 100 micrograms of LSD would be about 190 Australian dollars, or roughly 750 per hit. Uh, it's, there's obviously no way to know who you're ordering from, but we've talked to a lot of people who've actually received products that they were expecting to receive through this system. It seems a little sketchy. <laughs> Those ingesting unknown, untested psychoactive products are volunteering themselves as human guinea pigs, possibly contributing to the state of knowledge, yes, but also risking their health. There are a number of reports of lasting neurological problems and highly addictive effects from some of the new research chemical products, and some have been uh, uh, associated with deaths in the last few years. In March of 2011, a 19-year-old man died in the U.S. after snorting a line of 2CE at a party. And, and labs confirmed that it was, in fact, 2CE. And then in May of 2011, just two months later, uh, two teens died after orally consuming 2CE that had been purchased online, but the labs then identified that material not as 2CE, but as bromo dragonflies. Which so, is 10 times more potent than 2CE. So they had taken what they thought was 2CE and then taken 10 times too much. Uh, so, you know, several stories have made their way through the media about people who have used, quote, bath salt products and have un undergo undergone paranoid psychotic episodes that ended in death. Mainstream news and governmental sources add to the problem by recycling moral panic cliches rather than describing real problems or solutions. Even otherwise decent sources like the New York Times in the United States uh, get caught up in describing every new drug with hyperbole about how it required you know, quote, a small army of medical workers to hold users down or comparing them to the worst drugs they can think of, saying things like, if you take the worst attributes of meth, coke, PCP, LSD, and ecstasy and put them together, that's what bath salts are like. Because, of course, that really draws a lot of users, is really the worst attributes of yeah, LSD, that's PCP, very and ecstasy all put together. Very, very right. popular. Recent Australian media stories warn of impending risk of drug madness caused by designer bath salts, but the stories also seem to make clear that there hasn't been that much in the way of current crisis in Australia, uh, with the primary evidence that they cite being, you know, news stories they refer to about a couple of deaths in England. The, the issue is really just proportionality. We aren't, we don't mean to be saying or suggesting in any way that there's no risks associated with these things, but a couple of deaths in England from one of the group of drugs uh, that was recently included as the second most popular recreational drug in the UK doesn't really tell us very much about how dangerous the substances are. So it's always good to keep in mind when hearing about these episodes in the news that pretty much any stimulant that you, humans use to stay awake for a few days at a time can easily result in delusional, crazy behavior. And the new caffeinone variants are no exception. Yeah, it's something, one of the main things that I've learned um, working on Arrowwood for the last 15 years is that the lack of sleep makes people stupid and crazy. No matter what, what caused yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't matter why you didn't sleep for two days. So the current conditions of the worldwide market in new psychoactives include the availability of new and untested chemicals. A prohibition-driven progression towards more potent drugs. The fact that little data is available about their use. The inability to verify what the chemical is that one's ingesting. And the proliferation of pure chemicals sometimes sold in large quantities, making accidental overdoses much more likely. Those are all very pretty negative things. But there's also an increase in availability of interesting psychoactives that many people are reporting are fun and useful. And there's, so far, always something new that's legally available. It, it, it probably takes some media and law enforcement attention away from the good old standards like MDMA or LSD or plant-based medicines like psilocybin-containing mushrooms or, uh, the, or changa. Changa. Changa? Chonga. Chonga. We can't say it. We, Not, can't, we say can't say it, it Australian anyway. Um, <laughs> although, it is, <laughs> although, although LSD is much more potent than almost all of the new drugs, it has roughly never been available to the general public as a pure substance. Uh, a university party in the United States right now is likely to have several different pure powders available with very different potencies and actions that could be any one of 50 different substances. One of the big challenges with the newly available and emerging chemical markets is the extreme difficulty that consumers face in knowing what the chemical is that they have. You know, whether they purchase an ecstasy tablet found from a friend, a bath salt from a website, or a pure chemical from a Chinese manufacturer, uh, most people really have very few options about how to identify the active chemical in, in a product that they buy. 
So one of the things that we're doing to try to help psychoactive users make sense of the situation is to provide testing services through our ecstasy data project. Well, primarily we test ecstasy tablets, um, most of them from the United States. We're also testing powders and research chemical products in order to try to figure out what's being sold. We're currently testing about 20 samples a month and publishing results on the website, on the ecstasydata.org website. But uh, even with that volume, we're paying $125 per sample to get them tested by the DEA licensed lab that we work with. It's, it's the only lab approved by the DEA to test anonymously submitted samples. And we pay an additional $5 to, the, to a second DEA licensed lab that destroys the sample and notifies the DEA in triplicate that the, that the destruction has happened. We really never thought we'd be in the position of paying the DEA to destroy drugs for us. <laughs> Thanks. It's a little weird. <laughs> Thanks. Good job, guys. So the, regu the, the regulatory oversight around this whole testing process makes it significantly harder to get a sample tested than it is to buy the illegal drug in the first place. You know, with a little bit of knowledge and interest, one can go online and buy recreational drugs with a credit card, shipped overnight. But to get them tested to find out what they're actually in them is more like a black ops situation where you have to send cash in an un un unmarked envelope to an, uh, to an address and then the results are sent to a third party, which is us. Unfortunately, the ecstasy, the ecstasy Data Project is really expensive to run, costing us over $10,000 a year in out-of-pocket pocket expenses directly to the lab, and that doesn't ex co cover any costs for the staff on our end to, to work on it. LSD was a new drug with no long tradition of use before it escaped into the wild in the 1960s, but it had seen more than a decade of animal and human research before that happened. And despite heavy use, it took until 1967 before it was controlled in the U.S., and in 1971, it became controlled worldwide with the UN Convention of Psych on Psychotropic Substances. New substances being turned out these days might see no animal testing at all, and only a few human bioassays before they're released and become available online internationally for purchase with a credit card. There's a benzodiazepine called finazepam that was unscheduled and hadn't really been uh, very well known. It was showing up in the underground and online markets with news about how it was being sold out of Russia. In July, the UK announced that uh, importation of finazepam was banned. And there's methoxetamine, MXE, um, which is a new ketamine-alike uh, that first showed up in really in late 2010, so it's really just sort of a year old. And it's been getting uh, increased attention this year. And although buying substances on the gray market means playing a little bit of uh, Russian roulette, uh, some products are exactly as advertised and are very pure. So a couple of months ago, we had a sample of methoxetamine that had been purchased by someone online, submitted to ecstasy data and analyzed, and it came back remarkably pure. So the, the, the main thing that's possibly interesting here is the upper part of this. This is a, a, the output from a GCMS machine, and the top part is the GC and the bottom part is the MS. The MS is too complicated to describe and isn't very interesting uh, for this in this uh, conversation, but the top, basically, this that extremely clear single peak sh uh, is a, uh, an image of how pure it was. There's only kind of one thing in this powder. There's little tiny bumps that you can see, but those are really just uh, noise level in the machine. And conversely, a sample of something called 4-MeO-PCP uh, was sent into our lab and tested just a week ago, and it was about the dirtiest sample of a research chemical we've ever seen. This is just a, a shot of a screenshot from the site, but the main thing is that the lab is not allowed to give us or anyone the information about the exact quantities of the substances that, uh, that are found in a, in a sample. But what they can give is, is proportions. So they can tell us um, that this, for instance. If there were two substances at equal amounts in the, in the sample, it would just be one part of the first and one part of the second. So in this, in this case, um, there were 18 parts of one piperidinocyclohexane carb carbon nitrile. Not, uh, not for MEOPCP. Uh, one and 14 parts of one piperidino one cyclohexane. Also not for MEOPCP. One part for MEOPCP. And one part of an unidentified chemical that our lab couldn't, couldn't tell what it was because they didn't have anything in their, in their reference samples that matched it. So there's, you know, of this, of this sample, which is off, off the same kind of weird research chemical market, only one thirty-second was, uh, was the product that was, it was labeled as. And the other things are actually um, uh, probably, the two top things are probably carcinogens. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, you want to go back? So the problems that our society has faced over the last 50 years in generating useful wisdom about the use of psychoactives and other chemicals and plant products are compounded by the rapid turnover that characterizes the now of psychedelic drugs. It really makes it 
difficult to impossible to learn a given chemical learn a given chemical over time. It's much more difficult for elders and parents to communicate uh, specific wisdom about the, the, the chemicals, the drugs, the plants, um, because they're constantly new and different. New practical safety data has to be developed constantly as quickly as possible for each new substance. It's one of the challenges we really face is that, is that we hear about a new chemical and suddenly there's, there's large amounts of experience reports being submitted to us and people talking about it and, and the trends come and go so fast but with large numbers of people using the chemicals in the meantime that we're, we, we're re regularly rushing to, to create new information pages to help people out but, during the period that, that they're using them. But we're also um, pretty wary. Of, that's a, it's, it's a, this is a weird job. We've got a weird job. <laughs> a weird job. The, um, uh, we've had the experience where um, vendors, you know, kind of choose to publish experience reports or write experience reports in order to try to promote the products that they're selling. And so there's a, there's kind of a, we have a, a large group of volunteers, well, a medium-sized group of volunteers that are constantly changing. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really big challenge to try to figure out what is noise and what is intentional. Mis and, and when's the right point with a new chemical to start publishing information about it? Because we don't really want to be advertisers. We don't want to be telling people about new materials that aren't actually out there. We're trying to provide information about the things people are encountering. And so we're, we're constantly trying to judge where that line is and when to start providing, you know, putting together information. Un unfortunately, really, the situation is just created by pr prohibition. Um, the whole problem of having newly available substances that might be more harmful and less beneficial um, continue to interrupt the learning cycle and the wisdom cycle that we need. So one of our missions has been to try to capture the available knowledge and wisdom about psychoactives. In part, the ongoing new drug conundrum has led us to realize that we need to not only continue to document practical facts, about individual psychoactive plants and chemicals, but also to be building the wisdom cycle around general principles of psychoactives and their use. In, in many cases, it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about LSD or acacia resin or cannabis or bath salts. There are many issues that, that, are, that are just in common. So learning what one needs to know about a substance before trying it. Learning how to watch for problem signs, either health or, or mental health or abuse issues. Uh, learning what sort of positive uses and lessons one can be watching for and how best to retain them. Learning when to check in with peers or elders for feedback about one's use or how to take and give feedback when, someone, when there's something going wrong and it's hard to give feedback. And developing information and protocols for how to manage drug-related issues and crisis through site sitters and guides and organized party or festival psychedelic care services. Learning how to integrate uh, the use of a wide variety of psychoactives into a healthy life that lasts you know, decades rather than years. And one of the things that we've worked on towards that end is a set of guidelines for responsible use, which outlines personal steps that people can take to minimize harms and improve the chances of positive outcomes. And it's I, published in the EGA journal that I think people got at the door. The little, I think people got a copy of that, so it's published in there. The state of the stone in 2011 isn't just defined by the availability of new recreational drugs, but also by the increasing population of older recreational users and the new issues specific to them. And while there's a lot of research into the effects of the use of psychedelics and recreational psychoactives on young people, there's very little research or collected wisdom in the effects and use by older people. You know, it, even though it wasn't just the teens who used psychedelics in the 60s and 70s, it wasn't a really large demographic. It wasn't a huge, no, a huge population of, of middle aged or older people who tried them. And so it wasn't until uh, now that we have a a population of people who are 50 and over who, are, who have used them and, and continue to use psychedelics. So the largest and best longitudinal stu survey data about recreational drug use in the U.S. is the Monitoring the Future survey study, which um, surveys junior high and high school students primarily, but then continues to follow those same individuals with additional surveys later throughout their life. They started that project in the 1970s, and they've continued it through today, um, more or less the same people running the thing. So it's been very consistent, and they have uh, done a great job of, of trying, to keep, trying to actually collect the data in a way that can, you can compare over the years. So as you can see, it's nearly 90% of the population who were in high school in the 70s who are now over 50, that's the, uh, the last. far right-hand end, who have tried an illegal drug in their lifetime, and around 15% have used an illegal drug in the last year. According to the Australian National Drug Strategies National Household Survey, 
About 60% of people aged 30 to 39 have used an illicit drug in their lifetime, and they estimate that it's about a third of the people over 40. Uh, the surveying people about their drug use in the general population is very, very difficult. Um, essentially, any disapproved behavior, uh, it's very difficult to collect good, reliable information about, and it's very difficult to even, uh, even if you know that you're collecting bad data, it's actually really, really difficult to figure out how to find out how bad your data is. And so um, there's a, a, one of the kind of funny things about this is this recanting effect that uh, has been documented by comparing different studies. The, the Monitoring the Future study is a longitudinal study where they actually have the same individuals filling out the, the survey year after year. And uh, so people who's, the recanting effect is when people say at age 12 that they didn't use cocaine, and then 14 they say they didn't use cocaine, and 16 they didn't use a cocaine, and 18 they didn't use cocaine, and then age 20 they say, yes, I tried cocaine, and then 22 they say they tried cocaine, and 25 they say yes, and then at 30 they say, no, I've never tried cocaine, and then at 35 they say, no, I've never tried cocaine. And what's interesting is that that recanting effect is uh, a, you know, a, knowable, a, a determinable percentage and on the previous slide, um, the, it's actually the difference between the two taller, taller things that the number of people who actually reported that they had ever tried any illegal drug is 83 percent, but it's 89 percent who, in two different surveys, had said that they had tried tried an illegal drug. And, uh, and it's actually it's it's what's really amusing is that the recanting rate is larger among particular types of people. So, better educated, higher paying jobs, law enforcement, and the military. Uh, are more likely to have at one point admitted to using an illegal drug. At two drug, points, even. Yeah. Or at two points. And then later say, oh, no, I was wrong about that earlier. I, I didn't actually take an illegal drug. I didn't inhale. Right, yeah. I didn't inhale, right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk about the kids' parents? In, Aust in Australia, the, the, it's, the, there's no survey that we could find that we've, that we've seen that's equivalent to that, that particular survey, um, and the National Household Survey, which is done, um, isn't, it, household surveys are, are difficult uh, to do because you have people sending booklets in, in Australia, booklets get delivered to homes, and then um, people fill them out, and, and for and the- they assure you it will be anonymous, of course. <laughs> yes, and p people who are under, under 18, I think, are required to have parental permission to fill out the, the booklet, and um, actually, uh, so you've got a situation where you've got young people who are filling out a, a booklet, booklet describing their illegal drug use that the parents are somehow involved in, and it, it's it's, it's very likely to produce good data. So very little has been written about the patterns of use in older versus younger users and how that affect, affects health issues or the outcomes of those experiences. And one difference is, is just the changes that older users make about, about set and setting or the frequency of their use or the amount of planning before they take any uh, psychedelic. And there's, there's less party use, more use at home, uh, more consideration of health issues and hangover effects. And second, uh, health risks change with age. Uh, most. The, the biggest change is that heart risks and uh, become a bigger issue, especially for men. And substances that increase heart rate and blood pressure need to have uh, special care taken by people as they get over 40. So only roughly 10 percent of 20 to 39 year olds have high blood pressure or symptoms of other cardiovascular diseases, while around 75 percent of those 65 and older do. Psilocybin doesn't increase heart rate that much, doesn't, doesn't really affect blood pressure that much. Um, LSD does a bit and much more at high doses. But the euphoric stimulants, the, pretty much the class uh, including MDMA as well as the newer research chemical euphoric stimulants, uh, substantially increase heart rate and blood pressure. And um, you know, older users report to us that they've found taking drugs like propranolol or atenolol helps keep their blood pressure under control while using uh, visionary drugs or euphoric stimulants. In addition to older users intentionally investigating pharmaceuticals to help manage increased health risks related to recreational chemical use, there's also a dramatic increase in the combining of recreational drugs with daily use medicinal pharmaceuticals that users are taking for other reasons. In, in the U.S., 25% uh, of adults age 45 and older take st a statin drug to help control high cholesterol. In one survey, 81% of people between the age of 57 and 81 used at least one prescription medication of some kind, uh, while 29% reported concurrent use of at least five prescription drugs. So 30% of the population uh, over 57 uh, is taking five different pharmaceuticals at a time. Which makes it very difficult to um, 
start managing the process of interactions between recreational psychoactive, let alone between the five pharmaceutical drugs. And then there's the you know recreational pharmaceuticals like Viagra, um, you know because most most uh, mostly older people have access to it, um, but it's also being used by people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, but on on the positive side. Uh, Viagra, sildenafil, and, and that group um, actually cause vasodilation and do not seem to be interacting dangerous, dangerously with stimulants. So at least it's not. Uh, it's not. But pretty much any of the recreational drugs or, or plants that in, you know increase blood pressure, which some do. So there's little data at this point about the risks and benefits of all of the myriad possible combinations of those pharmaceuticals and recreational uh, plants and chemicals, and the issue is compounded by an increase in the number of pharmaceuticals being taken by older and younger people alike. Over the last 15 years, the percentage of the population taking three or more prescription drugs has, uh, in the last month, has doubled. And it's worth noting that the massive investment in technologies designed to create new pharmaceuticals are the same ones being used to create new recreational and visionary drugs. The standard tools that are now used in academic and commercial drug development include extremely sophisticated databases into which one can enter a brand new, never described chemical structure and the system will attempt to digitally model how that chemical will affect the receptors in the body and brain and what the breakdown metabolites will be. So automated drug discovery, computational pharmacology, and very informed guesswork about how a new structure will act in the human brain are now the norm. And these tools are available and not just used by mainstream pharmaceutical companies, but by those developing new recreational and visionary drugs. Many of the substances on the research chemical market come directly out of the commercial pharmaceutical labs. One of the main cannabinoids found in the first generation of spice products is the homologue of a CP47497. It's named that because CP is the internal code used by Pfizer Pharmaceutical for all of the new chemicals they synthesize. The CP stands for Charles Pfizer, the company's founder. Yeah, yet, ag yet again, joining the ranks of LSD and MDMA, the active chemical in a new gray market product is being, being used by thousands of people worldwide which was, has already been made illegal in, in many countries, was invented by a massive pharmaceutical company. So the group that's doing research with psilocybin at Johns Hopkins University are doing some exciting work using older participants. It's worth noting that their participants were an average of 46 years old and were being given psilocybin at several dosage levels, including fully visionary levels. You know, and unless, unless, unless you follow Kalindi's uh, <laughs> advice. Yeah. Uh, with the exception of one case of accelerated heart rate, which Kalindi, resulted... Kalindi which resulted only in extra monitoring of vital signs, there were no serious adverse health effects among the 46-year-old um, volunteers, average age 46. The next decade looks to us like it will continue the trends of the last, the wild frontiers, more potent new drugs, more hand-wringing moral panic, more feckless legislative control, and faster drug turnover. We need to continue to collect and transmit wisdom gathered in the 60s about how to deal with newly available drugs. We need to spread knowledge about how people can be safer in their experimentation. And in addition to recording people's experiences, we need to record the reflections of people in their 60s and 70s about their lifetime use of visionary and recreational drugs, regardless of whether it's been a lasting relationship or a very short one, so that we can better figure out what successful and unsuccessful models of use look like. It, one, of my, one of the things that I'm most excited about these days is trying to figure out how to develop this a way that we can get uh, a, an actual wisdom tradition built in our culture in the, uh, in, in, in the United States, in Australia, in Canada, um, people online, so that we make sure that the, that the knowledge that people are, are winning, the people who are here uh, developing, can, can make sure to be saved and transmitted to the next generation. With better online systems for sharing and slowly improving scientific research, the increasingly mature visionary communities, people like everyone here, are part of building that wisdom cycle. So we're, we're going to end by, again, encouraging everyone here to make sure to tell your story. Whether that's about your individual experiences, about your life learnings with recreational drugs, uh, as well as specific evaluations of, of individual choices you've made, the mistakes, the good decisions, and how those have affected you in your life. You know, uh, people who come to a gathering like this are part of the wisdom base of the worldwide visionary community. And it falls on all of us to record the lessons that we've learned and just, you know, being here helps make that all happen. Thanks. So thanks, everyone. What are your thoughts on the ongoing 
uh, threats of internet censorship and sites like Arrowhead being screened out from the masses? Um, I think it was during uh, maybe a talk yesterday, not the evening talk. Um, I can't remember when it was, but um, uh, so we have we have a lot. There's a lot of censorship issues around sites like Arrowhead. Um, there's a, most of the many. I'll say many. I don't actually know most. Many of the internet filtering softwares that are used by institutions like schools or hospitals or things in the U.S. Yeah. In the U.S. I, I think here too. Um, here, um, use a database lookup kind of system, and uh, Arrowhead is often classified as a drug site, and is disallowed. So in in hospitals. Uh, that we, we, we so we work with poison control centers, and um, in in the United States, poison control centers are often inside hospitals. And in the hospital IT departments, they've installed many of them. They've installed these blocking softwares, and the poison control centers can't get access to Arrowhead and sites like it to look up information about the new drugs that people are reporting using. So we've talked to quite a number of, of doctors and toxicologists and poison control center people who end up, you know, needing to look up a, a drug that someone presents in the hospital, you know, saying. You know, they're, they're, they're in the hospital, clearly they're having some sort of health crisis, and they say, I've taken 2CE or MEOPCP, you know, right. and, and the doctors really want to be able to look that up and find out what it is. And when they go to their IT departments to say, look, you're blocking this, we sort of understand, but look, I'm the doctor, I work here, this, is, this, is, this entire place is here for me to be I'm able to I'm the head of the poison people. control center. We need to be able to, I need this for my work. And, you know, we've talked to a lot of people who have success in getting those unblocked, but sometimes people say that they, the IT department says, no, it's a, it's a, it's a drug site, and it's, you know, it's, it's too complicated allowed. to make the exception. You know, we could, we could get your computer on the other network, and then <laughs> maybe next week. And so it's, it, so that's, a, that's a particular problem. That there's, you know, there's been the uh, push to have the sort of the entire Australian net have some sort of weird filtering. I don't know. I use the word weird a lot, but uh, um, sounds unpleasant to me. Um, uh, you know, I, there's a, um, um, my brain loses people's names in some sort of weird, weird way. Um, the song. Okay, well, I'll get there. I'll get there. It'll be cool. Um, uh, there's m most, I, I try not to spend a lot of time worrying about things that aren't going to happen. And so I don't, I'm not saying that it's not going to happen, but um, that it's so bad to imagine that all of the world's internets are going to be, uh, the web, web is going to be sort of this weird kind of constrained down Chinese kind of, you know, truth machine um, it, it, that I, I, I try not to go there mostly. Um, I think that... I have faith that the subculture will figure out the ways around that if it happens. Yeah, the, you know, there's, there's the John Gilmore thing where he says, you know, the internet routes around, you know, uh, sees censorship as damage and routes around it. Um, I, uh, I'm not really sure. You know, the, the main thing is that, that there are a lot of technologies for getting around those kinds of things. Um, you know, you have to, be, at this point, you have to be kind of a dork. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, expert. Uh, uh, but it's, a, it's not that hard to set up a proxy and get around it. And it'll happen more and more the more it happens in... Um, I'm just wondering about the adulterants. Um, in the UK, in August of this year, there was some legal highs that were found to contain uh, PMMA, a paramethoxymethylamphetamine, which is um, of of that that series of drugs is a really, really, really dangerous one. And I'm just wondering, has that turned up in the US or elsewhere, or what are your thoughts on the possibilities of actually extremely dangerous drugs popping up amongst the legal highs? I, I, so I don't, I, I, without my database, um, I'm not going to be able to answer the question for sure, but I don't think we've seen PMMA in the United States. I know that, I know that there were um, some tests done by Energy Control in Spain that found some of that. And, um, it's the in insectoids are back. <laughs> this one's been very calm. We have a we very, have very, a very large moth sitting here on our table. It's, yeah, it's very it's, pretty. Don't touch it. <laughs> um, <laughs> One of the things that certainly those that sort of that specific issue always brings to mind for me is that I can't believe that testing services aren't more widely available around the world. That 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 in fact the the manufacturers of the chemicals can't get their products tested. I mean, I think in some in in I think a fair number of circumstances the vendors, the manufacturers and the vendors themselves don't exactly know what's in their final products and they're selling them because it's what they have 
ended up with as a final product, and so they're selling them. The, the Netherlands has a, a, pro, a project that we mentioned in last night's talk called DIMS, which um, they, uh, um, they'll actually test people, stuff for people in the Netherlands. Um, and in France, there's uh, like a lot of hospitals will actually test things for people who walk in with the thing, and there's, you, people don't get in trouble, and there's actually public funding. It's a free service. Um, but they, won't, they, all, they don't distribute that data in any way except to law enforcement and um, to some of the toxicologists. So it isn't, that data isn't available about what's, what's showing up in, in France. Um, in, you know, I think my, my main hope is that some of the tests like that we do on ecstasy data that get, have completely stupid results um, are one-off or small, very small batches done by you know, either people trying to screw with the knobs or people just trying to get in on the market in some way, in some small way, and hopefully it's just a few pills that get pressed like that. Um, there's no really real way to know. The only people who, who know um, have no uh, administrative or uh, institutional reason to share that knowledge. I mean, the, the DEA and other law enforcement agencies around the world do an enormous amount of testing of, of these drugs, and they do not share their information, and they hold it very, very tightly. Because what possible reason could there be for them to share it? Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. So it's you know even though we, we we work with testing groups in Europe and we work with some poison control people in the United States and we work with uh, toxicologists in mostly in Britain um, who do testing of street drugs. Um, even they, I mean, they, those people don't get access to the law enforcement databases. That yeah. so. Um, <sighs> it's a bad scene. The it it feels to me from our position like. Uh, if psilocybin, if there were one of each kind of class that were legal, let's let's say it was psilocybin, let's say maybe it was MDMA, and maybe um, you know cannabis, and maybe some kind maybe of a, a you know, yeah a, a few a handful of things plants. that are reasonably well known, maybe you know some of the plants, right? Well, under international conventions, as it probably everyone knows, that the plants aren't actually controlled; it's just the chemicals in them. And in the United States and in many countries, the um, the Except laws in are Australia. Well, so under, under inter I just meant under inter international convention. It's that it isn't required that you all uh, here uh, make the plants illegal. Um, but if the, if if one of each class were were legal, that really the level of experimentation into the new crazy who knows what they are and what they do and brand new chemicals would be dramatically lower. And it, it sure seems like it. I mean, it seems like it seems like if I mean. Uh, uh, there's a portion of the population that's going to experiment with with illegal drugs, with with thing, with disapproved things, and uh, it seems to us that the portion of people who would want to experiment with the unknown things, which haven't been tested, which are you know possibly adulterated, would be extremely small, and people would be generally satisfied with taking the the good Even fun the good fun drugs rather than yeah. the bad fun drugs. Yeah. Before the days of bath salts and before the days of K2 and so on and so forth, um, when research chems was sort of um, research chems, and even before that time when research chems were actually research chems, <laughs> um, <laughs> people like people like David Nichols, who's who's sort of the the real you know the real granddaddy of, of um, <laughs> neuropharmacolo you know, neuropharmacological research, um, created a lot of these, or I guess dreamt up and then various other people along with himself have created a lot of these chemicals to try and shed light on, on what's going on inside. And, and so do you think there's ever a time, we'd like to think there might be a time when these things come back to, to being able to shed really serious light on, on the deep questions? Well, I think that they are. Um, there just happens to be this entire side issue of human 16 to 22 year old guinea pigs who are part of that learning process. It's a, it's a strange... Um, I mean, and the, it's not the, the significance of, of that problem of publishing information about, you know, 5-HT2A receptor agonists, which basically if you read that in a paper, it means it's psychedelic, um, uh, that I don't want to, I don't want to overstress that, but that's, it's, it's, there's people who watch for certain terms that come through the research then, and the researchers who publish that stuff know about that, um, that those researchers are really interested in the experience reports. Um, we are often trying to, like, not often, uh, uh, occasionally we get uh, requests from, from uh, neuropharmacological researchers to say, have you heard of anyone trying this substance? Or because 
this, this is a thing that we, we give to rats and it causes this effect. And um, uh, we're trying to track down what research we should do, and it depends on whether or not the reports in humans match what we were seeing in rats. And so people will check with us to see if we have any unpublished experience reports, since we have a lot of unpublished ex experience reports, to see if there is additional data that they can use in directing their research, which is sort of an interesting you know, Feed weird feedback loop. Um, you know, it's that's probably good. Thank you very much from all of us for imparting your wisdom to start with. And I just wondered if you would mind regaling us of the tale, like insp uh, the inspiration behind beginning Arrowwood and where the roots of that came from, please. Sure. Regale. Regale. Here we go. Uh, so when we were in, in university, um, we were at a fairly, a very small, a very small university, very small, 500 students. and. Uh, very liberal, um, uh, no, no, no grades, grades, no grades. Uh, written evaluations only, um, honors university. And there were a lot of people who were using a, the, the broad array of available psychedelics at the time. And so, you know, his first week in, in school. I got, I got, I got to, I got to university and my first week I was offered cannabis, um, alcohol, LSD, still seven mushrooms. MDMA, which at the time they were calling Adam, uh, and it it just struck me that it was it was such a huge gulf between that the the people who I was meeting who seemed to be lovely people and I, I liked I liked hanging out with them and they seemed like fun fun intelligent articulate folks and and uh, the um. Uh, and it stood in, in such stark contrast against what I'd been told in high school health class when basically I was told that all of those things would, would make me crazy and stupid and break my brain and all that. And so it, the, the main question that came to mind for me um, was how do I figure out whether what these people are telling me um, are, is, is, is true, which is these are great and all, everything I've been told is a lie, or if what I was told in high school that they're very bad for me it was true. And so I, went to the, I just went to the library and th tried to find books on it and really couldn't. I mean, I found a couple of books, but it was really a un very unpleasant experience and asking the librarian for what, what do you know about LSD? You know? Um, <laughs> and trying to get a, 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 you know, try to find a book that's the one you want to read and then order it through interlibrary loan. So you're asking specifically about books about drugs at the library it seems pretty sketchy. And, and so just, just very, that was very simple that, um, you know, there wasn't that much available. And so we, we started collecting uh, papers and books and, you know, I got printouts and it was a very small little collection of stuff. And it, uh, after college, we were, um, we had worked in tech a little bit. We'd fired, done some tech, uh, some uh, technical documentation, which means by writing um, user manuals for, for software and mm -hmm. stuff. And I was working in database and um, um, 3D modeling stuff. Um, and, and we moved to California. And, and, and both, so neither of us had jobs. And so at the time, it was 1994, 1994. And basically, the internet was just taking the, off. The and web. So the web. The web was just taking off. And so uh, I decided that, that web design would be a, a fine thing to learn that would, that would pay my bills. And so um, I was using the data that we had collected about psychedelics as my practice data for creating web pages out of. And so I created a little tiny site, because you need something to like link things together to practice making pages and making a little website. And so um, we were on a couple of uh, email lists that were discussing psychedelics and psychoactives and in general. And use, Usenet, all the drugs and whatever. And so people would ask a question, and it would happen to be answered by some paper that we had downloaded and put up on a page in my little practice database. And so we would point people at the URL for it, and it really just sort of accidentally snowballed out of control from that. It was, it actually, you know, it was not, it was clearly just meant to be. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, we're, we're both reasonably well suited. We like spending a lot of time sitting in front of computers. Um, we, we don't really care for authority particularly. Um, if you tell, it's I, a little pathologically, if you tell me not to do something, <laughs> I, w I want to do it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I guess. Um, and. One of one of the parts of that of that question often is sort of what where's the word arrowhead from come from? How many people have already heard the story of where the word arrowhead comes from? Excellent. You can just good. Just good. One percent. Good. good. <laughs> <laughs> the um, 
So there's a uh, language group called Indo-European, uh, which is the Euro most of the European languages in, and Sanskrit and uh, Persian. And all of these languages share a theoretical parent language that they all came from. It's called Proto-Indo-European. There's no actual documentation. There's no stones with the language chiseled into it. It's all just a, a theory that uh, based on shared roots, so the, the word for father or mother or or cow, for instance, um, are all pretty similar across the, all those languages. And so you can go and buy a dictionary that's the a dictionary of Proto-Indo-European roots. And Arrowhead is made up of, of two main Proto-Indo-European roots. One is ER for earth, or the, the thing that we live on, the dirt. And uh, the other one is wid or, no, uh, wid or knowledge, or uh, Wicca, wise, the Vedas. It's the same, it's the same root for Vedas. And um, ERO is supposed to be suggestive of Eros, or the uh, Greek spirit. And our co concept that we were trying to get to was the birthright to knowledge, uh, the knowledge that's inherent in the world, the knowledge from the earth. <laughs> and also, it was uh, the design was to something unique. Uh, we used all of the search technology that we had available at the time. We wanted something that was um, globally unique. And if you looked it up, you could find it. All right, well, um, based on what you just said, I think you should stop uh, making Irrawood site, just cease all activities. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you should do that. All right. Why? <laughs> well, reverse psychology, right? I see, oh, I see, oh, I see. Yeah. I, see. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think it works if you tell me that, though. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. It's illegal, it's illegal. <laughs> Well, that's, it's the, the main, before we started working on the site, or before we got very far on the site, um, we, uh, I asked a couple of lawyer friends to sort of spend a lot of time figuring out what the boundaries were in the United States for what one could publish and what one couldn't publish. What can, what can you say without going to jail? And in the United States, the, the First Amendment's extremely generous to publishers. Um, the main thing that we're not allowed to do is provide specific advice to people who are who we know are going to commit a crime with that advice. So if you once once you can answer a question about how to make LSD, as long as the person doesn't indicate or that or one should reasonably know that the person is actually going to take that advice and go and produce LSD without a license. Because of course you can legally produce LSD in many countries. You just most countries you just need uh, enormous amounts of special licenses. But it's surprising how often we get questions about something like producing LSD from people who will specifically say because it's illegal where I am, and it's very difficult to get, and so I'd like to make some, so I'd like you to tell me how to do it. And it's like, well, if you had asked in almost any other way, I could provide you with some documents about that, but now I can't. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so, so my actual question was that, um, but thank you for that. Um, <laughs> uh, you've got an enormous data set, and I'm sure you publish uh, a portion of that. Have you ever considered or have even done, I'm, I haven't checked the website recently, but um, like a data visualization sort of a project to, to sort of graphically display what you know? Well, um, so the main thing, so we have, we have statistics of visitors, the things that they're looking for. We have mostly, we have the experience reports and we've had a, a couple of different groups try uh, to do uh, word-based analyses of the, of the experience reports database, and the results of that are still forthcoming. Um, a few years ago, we really thought it was going to be done, and um, then the person graduated from college and got a postdoc work, uh, or sort of a post PhD uh, job, and it, that sort of ground to a halt a little bit. Um, so I picked that back up recently. But it seems like there should be some very interesting data about that, just in terms of all the things we've been talking about, the effects on people's life from people who take LSD and in what doses and what gender and what their weights, body weights are, and a lot of very interesting data. But and you can group words by, by there's, a, there's all these word groupings, word associations, how likely they are to occur in the same reports and how likely they are to be close to, to each other. And you can actually map these, these both individual words and words groupings in these sort of like multi-dimensional kind of 3D spaces and fly through them or whatever. <laughs> um, but... But one of the big problems is just that we are a very small organization, and so staff time is, you know, funding related, and funding is only as much of funding as there is, and so we would love to be able to do things like that, and we do them little bit by little bit as we can. And it's not done yet. <laughs> Final question. 
Um, yeah, when are you going to make an iPhone app? <laughs> so, um, the, the, one of the questions is, is, you know, can't they just magically make it work perfectly on an iPhone? But, um, the, uh, so we've been working with a couple of people on an Android app. Um, the person who was doing an I, the person who was working on an iPhone app just disappeared, and so that's, that's we rely on volunteers a lot, and volunteers often disappear. Um, you know, we actually we actually run Macs, but mostly I'm a we're a, I'm a Unix person, and um, and so the well, the whole world of sort of Apple development is a little bit frightening to me. Um, the Android world makes a lot more sense to me. It's a Java, and it's all. I, don't know, I know all that stuff, and so I, um, we are pretty close. Like I actually have a, a test version of a beta version of an Android app that isn't very good, um, uh, <laughs> and so we're hoping that we actually get to a somewhat better version. And but I, I was hoping that we would have one here at EGA, and we do not. Um, Maybe sometime soon. But pretty Hopefully. soon, pretty soon for the Android app on the iPhone, it's um, it's an indeterminate amount of time from now. Well, once there's once there's an Android version, though, it's more likely that someone will step forward and be able to recreate that for an iPhone. So, right. yeah. actually, the gentleman, one gentleman who has had something to do with the creation of the iPhone, is also no longer with us. But apparently, he had a pretty good pedigree from our point of view, <laughs> from what we hear, anyway. 